Hey, I believe we are live. Are we? Yeah, I think we might be live. It's receiving data from the encoder. Hold on just a minute. Let's check this out. Kind of an interesting night, everybody. <laughs> if we mm -hmm. are indeed live, which I can't see. Let's see. Well, well, I'm still trying to access the old episode. That would not help. We are veggie lasagna esque tonight. If we are. We're doing our impersonation <laughs> of veggie lasagna. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It just gets weirder and weirder. We are live, according to YouTube. I'll be goddamn if I can find the fucking video. Uh, yeah, we are live. Yeah. It's playing. You there can... we go. Yep. Excellent. All right, I guess we should start the show. Hey. Yeah. What do you think? Blank. You want to start the show? Yeah, let's do it. Mute your damn phone. <laughs> Doing that now. <laughs> we got a show. Yeah! We're going to talk about... Oh. <laughs> Fuck it. It's that kind of show tonight. Uh, yeah, it's that kind of show. So for those of you that... I don't know. I, probably no one's watching right now. Yeah. Because we had to change links. So if you're watching this now, it's not live to you anymore. But we are actually live. Uh, my teaser was going to say something along the lines of we're going to talk about stuff. <laughs> we did so, it three times. So we're going to talk about some stuff. Uh, hey, thank you. Welcome once again to the Movies and Stuff show. My name is Dan. This is Abe. Hey, And what's up? we're going to do a show tonight. And our first topic is going to be Paramount versus Axanar. It is. And here we go. Yep. It's amazing you know, how disheveled things can get so quick. Uh, it's, we're doing a show. That's all that matters. <laughs> uh, thanks to Justin Lin and J.J. Abrams, they convinced Paramount to stop their lawsuit against Axanar. Instead, there will be guidelines for future film creators to follow when making Star Trek fan films. You know, we have been following this lawsuit since oh, yeah. pretty much day one. Uh, what do you think of this outcome? I'm actually shocked. I am shocked by this. I cannot believe that Paramount is uh, just letting this one slide. I It boggles my mind. I thought there was no way. The way those guys at Axanar were flaunting themselves at Paramount and just being dickheads <laughs> yeah. I, just, I thought there was no effing way yeah they were not being humble at all no they weren't we wrote the we're gonna create the greatest star trek movie ever yeah crazy i think i think there's a fear over the next star trek film and i think justin lynn is basically saying is like people seem to love this axonar it's not coming it's not competing with us it's generating buzz for the star trek brand Let's throw the fans a bone and let them make the fucking film. Now, they haven't made the film yet. No. Right. No. So <laughs> let's see if see if you're going where I'm going with this. They could easily make the film. And then Paramount's like, well, you didn't follow our guidelines. Oh, I don't think so. I, th I think this is more... If we're going to put on tinfoil hats on this one, I actually think this is more for the new movie, uh, Star Trek Beyond. Oh, oh, absolutely. Uh, just, Justin Lin and J.J. Abrams come riding in on their horses and but, save the but fucking that's, day. But that's what I'm saying now. It's building this goodwill Yeah. so people will go see this film. Yeah. But since Axnar has not been made yet, when does Star Trek Beyond come out? Uh, July, right? June. Is Axanar going to be out by oh, that time? No, hell no. Is Axanar going to be made by that time? No. That's what I'm saying. Paramount has nothing to lose right now from dropping the lawsuit, mm -hmm. setting up these guidelines, letting them make the film, yeah, and then scrutinizing against the guidelines. It could take years until it comes out. I don't think Paramount's losing here because they built goodwill for their next movie. 
people seem to think, hey, Paramount's doing the right thing. But who says they have to actually go through with the right thing? Man, I don't know. I don't want to think that. No one wants to think that. I'm just, hey, I'm trying to play devil's advocate here of why they would drop a lawsuit that they would have won. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a good point. That's a good point. I just, I still think it's just to win the fans over because Star Trek is in such a weird place right now. Mm-hmm. Nobody likes, I, you know, apparently nobody likes his films anymore. That's all they do is bitch about him on Facebook and, and the not Star Trek. With you. Not disagreeing with you. They can still yeah. build the goodwill right now. And still, at the very end, Axanar might not come out. Because if they make it and it doesn't meet these guidelines, we've yet to see what these guidelines are. That's true. Yeah, I don't know. That, that's an interesting point, and I hadn't really thought of it. It'll be fun to keep an eye on, see what happens. Yeah. But you got to feel good about the uh, Klingon language lawsuit now. <laughs> Maybe Paramount will just capitulate all over the place. Well, yeah, I mean... You know, uh, the Klingon thing, uh, when we talked about it, it was yeah. a couple of weeks ago. It, it was just fascinating because so many shows have made up languages now. Right? Yeah. I mean, like Battlestar Galactica, did they have any? Yeah, well, they made the frack and the filter carb. Yeah. They had a couple of made up things, right? And uh, Game of Thrones mm-hmm. has several made up languages. But people, there's like universities that teach Valerian and Dothraki right now. <laughs> Well, I mean, the guy the guy that invented the languages is actually pretty brilliant. I've actually read um, about him and read his story and his history and his background in linguistics, and it's pretty fascinating. But it just goes to show you is, is it has elevated beyond just being a copyrighted material. Now, I understood what Paramount was going with. It's, it's not like people have to be using this language to communicate. Right. It's not like people are being born in an area where they're only speaking Klingon. Though, that would be kind of cool. No, would, that, be, yeah. would, would that Would that little town be sued by Paramount? <laughs> yes, no, uh, yes they would, so, yes. Uh, I don't know, yeah I, yeah, I I don't want to think negative about it. I think you're right. I think it's all a positive thing. I think Justin Lin and JJ realizing that the, you know, they can't. They, this franchise is in a weird spot. It's even in a weirder spot because they've separated the brand of TV versus the brand of movies. Right. CBS and Paramount are separate. Right. Yeah. And so, I think there's more of a buzz around. Uh, was it Brian, Brian Fuller? Right. Yes. Is, uh, doing uh, the show. Right. So I mean, I think there's more of a buzz around that than there actually is this latest movie. Though we'll get into that in a little bit. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, let's move on to our next topic. We're going to talk about two Danish directors uh, fighting it out. Uh, Nicholas Reffin has a new movie out. It's called The Neon Demon. And uh, much like all of his films, it is getting mixed and somewhat angry reactions. Nice. But, you know, that hasn't stopped Reffin from taking a few shots at another Danish director, Lars Van Trier, who he says is over the hill and a drug addict. He also says that Lars tried to sleep with Reffin's wife until he found, quote unquote, some other slut, which is a weird quote. Because did he just call his own wife a slut? Yes, he did. Some other slut. Some other slut. It, it's a bad phrasing here. I don't think that's what he meant. Uh, you know, in general, I've been a fan of Von Trier's work. You know, uh, personally, I think he does come off a little, I don't know, douchey. And admittedly, he admittedly he's he's, you know, he's a drunk and a drug addict. He said it. <laughs> he's essentially quit directing to focus on being sober because he felt he couldn't be creative unless he was drunk or high. So, I mean, I guess Reffin has some points, but uh, what do you think about this? Well, I mean, I I, I don't think he's wrong. I don't think Reffin is wrong. Uh, I think he's got his character pretty much uh, nailed. But Reffin's like, Reffin hasn't earned taking a shot at somebody like Von Trier yet. You don't think so? No, I don't think so. I don't think anything Reffin's done has even sniffed like Dogville or Breaking wow. the, Breaking the Waves. I think maybe Dancer in the Dark and Antichrist might be on Reffin's level. But he's yeah, he's got a long ways to go before he can start taking shots at other people's work. 
I don't know. I, I kind of disagree with you on that. <laughs> I know. I know you do. You like. I mean, because I, mean, I think Bronson is a, is a brilliant film. I think The Hollow Rising is an absolutely brilliant film. Uh, only God forgives. I mean, the, the, he's he's got. I think I think uh, I think Reffin's earned it. Personally, I do. Um, and again, like I I found like you know. I yeah I'm I'm I don't dislike Von Trier. I know a lot of people do, and I I don't. Uh, but I also think that Refn is a brilliant filmmaker, and I'm so looking forward to Neon Demon so much. Oh, I know you are. Yeah. And but isn't it interesting though? Is I I do think that they have similar reactions to their films. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think uh, I think in many ways, you know, uh, Von Trier was a, a spiritual kind of predecessor to Refn. Oh, I agree with that. Yeah. You know? uh, but did you see Nymphomaniac 1 and 2? No, I still haven't seen that. No. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not even saying that Von Trier isn't a has-been now. I'm just saying. So we can say it. So yeah. we can, we've can. we earned that right. Yeah, and I'm just saying. if you're, Revan if, hasn't. Yeah, if you're going to talk shit on somebody else's films as a filmmaker, <sighs> yeah, you might want to be on that same level before you do it. I'm just yeah. saying. I think he's on that same level. I want to see. What, I I can't wait to see when people watch this episode. Hopefully, they watch it. They're not going to the other link. It's like, why isn't this working? Yeah. Hopefully, like, people are watching this and they will comment. Well, somebody uh, somebody is commenting. Uh, uh, a gentleman named Sirius Russell. He wants to shout out to Hugh Jassel. Oh, yeah, and he says, uh, "My son is listening, and Dan is using sophomoric language. <laughs> he wants an apology." I'm using sophomoric language. Yes. What did I say? Uh, yeah, I don't think you really said anything. Okay. I just, I think that's just, uh, that's New Jersey humor for you. I don't quite get it. All right. All right. Um, uh, I apologize then. <laughs> uh, anyway. Yeah. Moving on. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like our energy is a little low. Let's kick it up a notch for this next. All one. right, all right, all right. All right let's do it. This is actually this is actually an exciting one. We're we're going to talk about something that people love uh, more than anything in the world, and that's the Marvel Cinematic Universe. That is all that people care about in this world. <laughs> and uh, so we're going to spend some time talking about how amazing the Marvel Cinematic Universe is because of the fact that now the Bluths are part of the MCU. It sure looks like it, doesn't it, from that picture? You sent me a screen cap of yeah. this one. Apparently, the Russo brothers directed five episodes of Arrested Development and yes. included a very nice Easter egg in Captain America Civil War. The Bluthmobile. So, I do believe that the Bluths are now part of the MCU. I just wonder, can we get a character called The Illusionist, <laughs> played by Joe Bluth? Yeah. I want him to be a villain in Doctor Strange. The illusionist, Michael. That'd be so awesome. The Aztec tomb versus Doctor Strange. They uh, they go have a fight at the uh, Gothic castle. <laughs> Daddy loves leather. <laughs> Stupid, forgetful Michael. Oh, God. But yeah, no, it really looks like it. And, you know, we're talking about Star Trek. Shit like this in a Star Trek film is like, there's continuity built around that. I got to really wonder how Marvel is going to handle this down the road. Are people literally going to start thinking an Arrested Development is a Marvel, uh, inside the Marvel Universe, I should say? Yeah, it's it's opening a, a weird can of worms. It really is. Yeah. I'm just so curious about where to go with that. Because, I mean, I, I'm totally seeing now, like, the blues in a comic book form in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or in the Marvel Universe, I should say. <laughs> oh, my God. But, yeah, it's really cool. No, I thought that, you know, again, like... I was, you know, Civil War was okay. Yeah. It was all right. Uh, but seeing this actually made me excited. I'm like, oh, now it's even better. Now it's actually the movie that people love. Like, I see it now. It's because I missed it the first time around. <laughs> now you love the movie. Absolutely love it. It's yep. the greatest, greatest comic book film ever made. Yeah, it's pretty interesting, though, that I, I mean, I, I'm at the Marvel fatigue. Uh, season four of Arrested Development certainly made me feel like I had Arrested Development fatigue, or whatever the hell they wanted to call that show, <laughs> that 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 pod people show of you know that they called the Bluths and Arrested Development. That was just 
It's... I also disagree. I disagree. No. You're, 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 you're losing it, man. You're losing it. How'd you not like that season? That season was great. Let's see. It sucked. It sucked. <laughs> They lost the characters, man. Who's using sophomoric language now? Oh, fuck that shit. <laughs> Turn it up. I hope your son listens. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, that, that that show lost the characters uh, completely between the, the, the show when it was on TV and the Netflix edition. The characters were gone. Michael was not Michael anymore. And I love reading those articles where people are trying to do those backflips to like, well, no, Michael actually was kind of like that in the show. Fuck off. It was wrong. Lindsay was wrong. Tobias was even wrong. It just didn't work. Tobias was on. Oh, come on. Oh, he was funny, but I don't help, know. Yeah. Help daddy get his rocks off. <laughs> Some of those lines were funny, no doubt. They were so good. I mean, they were so classic Tobias. I felt Tobias was, uh, you know. I, I, I agree with you. I think Michael was off. I think uh, yeah. George Michael was off. I think uh, I think Job was, was dead on, though. I think Job was... He shined in that season. I think Job was was fantastic. Well, Job uh, always shines in, shines in every uh, every episode. He's just awesome. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, I really felt that uh, him and uh, him and Ben Stiller. That stuff was great. <laughs> no, I'm, it, it, I, I, there was, it was. I can't. I don't, know. I don't have anything to say because I didn't really like it that much. Yeah, you didn't like you didn't like that whole storyline with the masks. It was okay. It just. <sighs> Getting to that point was such a fucking beatdown. Like I don't know. Yeah, I disagree. I, I, I again, we're not gonna. What are we talking about the MCU? Uh, yeah. No. Yes. Right. I. <laughs> I liked what they did in season four. Yeah, I, I really did. Um, but I can see where you're coming from, though. It wasn't the show. It wasn't the show. No. But I still enjoyed it. Now I, feel, I finally see what all the Batman versus Superman crybabies feel. That's just not my Superman. Yeah. I'm moving on. I clicked. Play. All right. Clicked uh, play. Some new trailers released this past week. New Star Trek Beyond trailer. We were talking about that before. Oh, yeah. Uh, new Independence Day trailer. The aforementioned <laughs> Neon Demon trailer. A few others. Uh, I think Star Trek Beyond, this this trailer looked better than the previous one. Oh, absolutely. People actually yeah. talked? What? <laughs> yeah, I was really. It, it looked it, it infinitely better. I'm still yeah. I'm still nervous, of course, but it looked a no, hell, it's hell of a lot better. It's not going to be good, but the trailer <laughs> at least looked better than than the first one. What do you uh, think? What do you think? Is it going to be better than into uh, Star Trek Into Darkness? Let's make our predictions. I think so. I yeah, think gonna be, I think it's going to be better than. Yeah, that. I think so too. I think uh, that's marginally. Like I think it's, I mean, <laughs> just just by the hair of its nose, it's going to be. It's better. Good. I mean, I don't think. I don't think it's going to be well written. I don't think it's going to be a great story, but I don't think they're going to make the critical errors that Into Darkness made. Right, right. And I think that Justin Lin is going to try to do at least something different, which uh, could, you know, uh, change the dynamic a bit and and, and make it not feel like Into Darkness. Because if you get that feel of Into Darkness, it already starts off at that level, and then there's only... It's only going down from that point. I agree. You know? I agree. If it looks a little different, if it's a little bit faster paced, and if it feels a little different, I think people get out of that. They, they won't equate it right to Into Darkness, which I think will, will favor the film. And as long as they don't make those critical errors, I mean, geez, a Spock in Into Darkness. You talk. You want to talk about characters who are out of character? Oh uh, yeah, it's a good point. You know, like what they tried to do with Spock and Kirk, and the whole flip flop between those two. In Into Darkness just failed miserably. And I like Zachary Quinto as an actor. I really do. Uh, and when they cast him as Spock originally, I was like, wow, that is the perfect Spock. I think he's going to be great. And then they give him that shit script in Into Darkness and watch him become a fraction of the man that Spock should have been in an alternate reality, split timeline, whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, so to answer your question, I do think that this will be a little bit better than Into Darkness. Just a little bit. Yeah. Hey, cool. Yeah. Uh, That's, Neon that Demon, might be though, good enough. That might be good enough. That's uh, just yeah. a little bit better. Neon Demon, did you see the trailer for that? I did. It, 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 again, it looks like an outstanding uh, visual movie. So it is known for, man. Yeah, it is, really. Whether or not he can actually 
get the story <laughs> there. That's that remains to be seen. I don't know, man. I thought I don't want to get into it again. I'm mean, on <laughs> honestly. I okay. I'm not dissing the man. Uh, you're right. Uh, he is made some good movies. Valhalla Rising, outstanding. I really like to drive. Too, but sometimes he just does not uh, get the story right. He just doesn't, or doesn't flesh it out. Or what? What was the story you always told me that he in uh, Only God Forgives? He really didn't even know what he was making at the time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It shows. It kind of shows. It it doesn't quite have the firm hand. It's got an amazingly visual eye, but not necessarily a firm hand at the wheel. Yeah, I you know I I think. I think a lot of times uh, what what Reffin has in his mind, what he sells to people that he's going to make, and what actually happens on screen are absolutely three different conflicting things. And uh, I think that's part of the issue there, is, is that... That could uh, be. Is, is that there are like conflicting things that he's trying to do. Like what's in his mind, what he's told people he's, he's going to do. And what he can physically accomplish. Yeah. I think they're, they're, they're three different things at times. Yeah, uh, that's that's the only negative I'm going to say about it. Other than that, it looks fucking awesome. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm all in to, to just at least see it. Yeah. Uh, there's apparently necrophilia and cannibalism. So what else do you need? Not much. Not much. Are we even going to do a break? Let's not even take a break. You want to just keep going? You want to go right to? Let's just keep talking. Heck with it. No, no breaks. Let's just keep going. Let's go. Can you do that? Are we possible to do that? I can't. Do you want to take a break? Yeah, I keep talking for just a second. Okay. Yeah. Well, we're going to talk about Highlander this week, and we that's are. what we're going to do. Uh, um, usually, we take a break. I don't want to take a break because we started like 20 minutes late today. We did. Because of something. We don't. Do we even know what happened? Nope. That's awesome. See, that's the worst part is we had a show that was messed up, and we don't know what went wrong. And I'm going to be honest with you. My internet's been out of my house for the last couple of days. I'm running on uh, some kind of Verizon 4G jetpack thing. I don't a mini jetpack ellipsis. I got this device right here that is like shooting internet into my computer. That, that's all I know. Um, so it was a miracle that I was even able to sign on to, to actually do the show. But I'm not to blame. I'm not taking the blame on this one. <laughs> You're not. I have nothing to, you know, nothing to do with it. All right. Uh, Let's see if we can do this. Let's just sw swap over to Highlander to talk. Let's try it. Oh, yeah. That's okay. it. That's it. <laughs> I just swapped over to Highlander talk. There you go. Uh, we're going to talk about Highlander. We're going to air an interview with the director, Russell Mulcahy. You know, it's spelt Mulcahy. Mulcahy? It's Mulcahy, all right? If you see it spelled, like, it's it's Mulcahy, just so you know that. Uh, Islander, I feel, is a remarkable film. I think it, um, it instantly fuels the imagination. It's about a group of people locked in this tournament to the death. They're sword fighting. Uh, they're, they're on rooftops. They're fighting in parking garages. They're in back alleys. I think it's a brilliant concept. Now, I saw this film when I was younger. We got the VHS of it. I mean, who did not want to get that VHS? That that cover. That cover just drew you in. And then you find out that Sean Connery's playing this badass fighting Spaniard guy. And you're like, I have to see this hot mess. But it wasn't a mess. It was actually really good. Uh when did you see it? What did you think when you saw it? Man, I saw it on VHS 2 at some point in the 80s. I can't remember exactly when. And just like just like you said, man, as soon as you hear that fucking concept, you are all in. You're like, holy cow, I've got to see that. Because it just, the idea just somehow just really grabs some part of your imagination and won't let go. People have been living, you know, or you know, throughout history, and they're all locked in this battle. And the only way they can die is to cut off their head. How does that not just just grab the shit out of you and just like 
that's amazing. Like you, you can just picture like knights and, and then, you know, civil war, world war one, all this, you know, as a backdrop for this much larger uh, conflict. It's kind of like what Ben and Justin are going through in carnival. Right. Yeah, the, I, absolutely. I totally agree with you. Yeah. Uh, on the surface though, you, you, you start throwing these ingredients into the pot. It, sh- it shouldn't taste good at all. You're talking, <laughs> you, honestly, you're talking about a guy who doesn't speak English as your lead actor, like doesn't speak a lick of English. You're talking about Sean Connery playing this ancient Spaniard. You're talking about a director that is known for music videos. You're throwing in a soundtrack by Queen. You know, uh, talking about time travel. Well, not time travel, but like essentially going through periods of time, uh, having a period piece and modern day, and the modern day is set in the 80s, and the 80s looks like shit anyway. So... You're having all this stuff. You, you put it in a blender, and it's like, man, this is this is, this is gonna taste like worse than like those raw eggs that Rocky was drinking or something like that. Um, but it doesn't. It tastes it tastes wonderful. It tastes it tastes like awesome. How that, the hell did they pull that off? No idea. Because it, 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 in one aspect, it is amazingly inventive with its concept. The other aspect, it's incredibly cliched. It's just, <laughs> it works like the. Like, think of that fight in the Madison Square Garden. It is not done well. Spatial relationships are terrible. You can't tell what people are, but it works. It works so well on an emotional level. I mean, think of that scene where Connery first first meets uh, 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 Connor McLeod. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he's standing there and like, what you're feeling is the quickening. And they're like this close together. And the <laughs> next thing you know, Connery's like way over there, standing on a mountain. We are brothers. It doesn't make a lick of sense, but it it just works, and I don't know how the hell they do it because it it shouldn't. It works in spite of itself. Yeah, and and that was gonna be my, my oh, topic sorry. number two, if you will. No, 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 it's a great segue into it. Uh, that was topic number two. It's it's you know, uh, you're right. You're right. It, it it works in spite of itself, and I think my personal opinion is the vision of Mulcahy. I, I honestly think that that is what drives this film forward. Is he he has this vision, he's committed to it, and he just made it work. And I think, you know, at the time, uh, Connery was I wasn't saying he was phoning it in, but he didn't have much. You know, I think. Uh, you know, he basically only had like a couple of days to shoot some scenes or something like that, like the way that it was working out. And uh, he puts on a fun performance. And I think it's because Mulcahy, like putting that like passion, I think, I think he's just a passionate guy. Yeah. And I think it rubbed off on even Connery, who's just kind of like, I'm here for a paycheck. And, you know, but he was good. He was good. I think, and I think it's just like, like Mulcahy's personality is infectious. And I think that that got the cast and crew like to buy into this and that's what made the film work in my opinion absolutely i think you're 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 spot on there yeah it had to have been i mean russell had to have just just somehow inspired them to achieve more than what they thought they were probably getting into especially connery who just you know dipped in for a paycheck and was dipping out as fast as he could and he probably had his wristwatch on off camera just looking yeah (laughs) But somehow, he, 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 it's more than the sum of its parts, I guess. Yeah, that's it. Again, the, yeah. the, the separate ingredients should not work. The final dish turns out well. And I don't, I don't want to like come off and seem saying it sounds like we're being negative of this film because it, I, I, I don't want to come off that way. There's some amazing scenes in there, some great fight scenes throughout this film. Um, I enjoy the final fight scene and the lead up to it. Uh, like the lead up to it, it's almost like a Halloween film at times where, you know. Oh, I think we just had our Skype issue. Yep. So Dan left. We'll see if we can get Dan back in a minute. If not, (laughs) we lost Dan for good. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Now, let's see. Maybe we can get Dan back. Music. Let's talk about music. Somebody was talking shit that I didn't like Queen. Queen's awesome. This is the greatest title sequence in the history of movies. It it starts with Sean Connery narrating some stuff in the bathroom. 
That's actually did. He, he narrated it in the bathroom. And then it kicks into Queen and just black background red text. It's awesome. So yeah, the movie might be dated, but it's an amazing film. I love it so much. Dan's not coming back. We're going to take a quick break. And then we're going to do uh, our interview with Russell Mulcahy. Or Mulcahy. Mulcahy. I still don't know if Dan got that right. He's not here, so I can talk shit on him. I still think it's Mulcahy. So, well, thanks for watching, everybody. And if you get a chance, <laughs> if this hasn't totally put you off, please subscribe. Bye-bye. <laughs> Joining us now on the show, the director of Highlander, Russell McKay. Russell, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure. So I want to ask you just right off the top, Highlander is an action. It's an epic. It's a noir. It's a historical romance and it has a dash of police procedural in it. How the hell did you pull that off? Uh, yeah, um, I, I, I think when I was offered the script and I read it, but, I mean, obviously I, I love genre type films, a uh, huge fan. Yeah. And, um, but what really drew me, um, to this, to this film was its incredible, uh, sense of romance, um, uh, through the ages in, in, in its, in its fantastic story. Um, you know, from the 15, you know, 1578 and up until the sort of the 20th century. And, um, uh, and I, and I, and I, I just love that passion that the story held in, in its heart. Um, and amongst that, then you can have all the wild action and the craziness and the, and the flashbacks <laughs> and and whatever and the characters. But I think the driving force to me, and I think the driving force when I brought Queen into the music, uh, a lot of the driving force um, that inspired them to really get involved in the film um, was was you know the the the, the, the romance of the, of the film. Now, I mean, the film's now almost 30 years old. You guys started making it in, 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 uh, I know. in 85. It's, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it, was only, it was only my second film. I mean, it was yeah. very well now, yeah. now, yeah, as you kind of reflect back, like what jumps out at you is like kind of the you know, most important experience of making the film. Uh, like any, anything just jump out at you saying like, hey, this, this, was, this was the memory I have from making this film. Um, probably uh, there, 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 there's many, um, one being, uh, offered it in the first place, I guess, um, after I'd, I'd done Razorback and I uh, went off and carried on doing videos with Duran and Elton and whatever. And, um, and I think I was just doing the wild boys with Duran Duran when I got the phone call. Um, to come and have a meeting and they sent me the script and I had a meeting with the guys and uh, we hit it off with the producers Bill and Peter Bill Panzer and Peter Davis and um, just hit it off and uh, and they said let's just do this um, um, but I think oh God one of the one of the the earliest memories I have was when we decided to um to uh, you know, get Sean Connery, and I remember going up to, to the Savoy Hotel in London, nervous as crap, <laughs> and knocking on the door, and the door opens, and there is Sean Connery. You know, I'm thinking before the door opens, thinking I'm going to meet, I'm going to meet 007. Oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> and, you know, the hero I grew up with, um, and um, and um, there he was in real person, and we sat down, and had a cup of tea, and. Um, and uh, got along and light a house on fire and um, sprang out some ideas and this and that and uh, that was that was that was something else. Um, and I think the other time was um, I think just just being in 
been on location in Scotland um, and 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 feeling that landscape um, um, and uh, the pure sort of um, strength of that landscape and the fact that in one day you would get four climates, it'd be sunny, it'd be rainy, it'd be stormy, it'd be windy, it'd be sunny, it'd be you get every climate in one in, in twelve hours. Um, and it just spoke to you. Um, and and the and the and the Scottish people were just so wonderful and they stood there in the bog in their kilts and whatever and they didn't complain and or when it was a shot of whiskey and then boom, they were ready to go and <laughs> and and there was such there was such passion with them with them and the crew. Um we didn't really have um much interference with studios or anything. We were just like let loose with this film. So for example when we we're in the car park scene uh, which is meant to be in Madison Square Garden, but it was actually shot in London in, in an underground car park. Um, and I said, okay, let's uh, hit the sprinklers so it starts to rain in the car park. And then the spike carries on and there's this, all the light, all the headlights start exploding and for no rhyme or reason. And, uh, um, and basically, uh, it, it, there was, there was great, creative freedom um, in the filmmaking. Uh, you know, I mean, I was a, uh, a video maker and uh, I guess they wanted me to have that freedom to, to just um, go for it. Nice, nice. You know, one thing I think really Highlander does well is it thwarts expectations. It doesn't give the audience a hero of the modern age versus an ancient evil. Instead, I think it, Kurgan is the one who is seemingly more modern than Connor. Was Kurgan a bit of maybe social commentary about the 80s? Well, yeah, yes, yeah, absolutely. Um, in fact, you know, he, he, sort of, he dons on that sort of that, sort of that punk um, with the... With the um, the needles through his neck and whatever, and the yeah. shaved head, and uh, he definitely had that sort of um, skinhead, uh, what do you call it, punk sort of that attitude. And uh, so I guess that was that was a, um, a, 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 not, not maybe not intentional, but it was definitely influenced <laughs> by by the period in London. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah. again, I was surrounded by a wonderful cast, and and the funny thing is, we had. I remember when we when we cast Crystal Lambert, we're going, well, who's going to play Highlander? And I'm sitting in the office in in, in LA, and we have to be, and we're going, who's going to play him? All these names have been banded around, and I'm flipping through a magazine, and I saw Christoph's picture from Greystoke, mm. and I looked at this picture, and I looked at his eyes, and I went, this is the guy. And I looked and went, who's that? And, and all of a sudden he was cast and he couldn't hardly speak a word of English. <laughs> um, and he, um, we cast him, so we looked at this French guy who could hardly speak any English. And uh, we had a Scotsman playing a Spanish Egyptian. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the most bizarre casting, but no one seemed to mind because the the chemistry between the two of them, they became very close friends during the shoot, and uh, the chemistry really showed. And then, then throwing Clancy, who was such a wonderful actor, um, uh, just really grounded everyone, and um, and, and on screen uh, was just so fabulously threatening. Um, that it, it, it was just, you know, it, 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 it's... What's what's tough about filmmaking sometimes is getting that chemistry right um, with the cast and, um, and and everything basically. Um, but uh, it's one of those times when when and you don't, you don't even quite know it when you're doing it. Uh, you get a sense of it, um, but it, 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 it's it's wonderful when that chemistry just works. When you manage to just put the right amount of salt in, the right amount of you know, sort of 
high end, you know, whatever, you know, just, <laughs> and all of a sudden, the, the, you know, the dish turns out. Right. Yeah. And, and you don't, yeah, you don't even really blink an eye at, at the casting choices in the movie. It, it just, it did work so well, despite, no, it, despite, no, despite no, what you're no, saying, indeed. you know? No, no, it, it, um, uh, and there wasn't really a thought when we were shooting it that, like, uh, does anyone quite hear his slightly French or whatever? <laughs> 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 but, uh, no, no, it, 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 I think everyone was just being in, in, engrossed in the story. And it really was the script, uh, the original script, which was called the, the original, it was based on an original screenplay by Gregory Wyden. Um, it was called The Dark Knight. And um, and then Larry Ferguson and Peter Bellwood came in and worked on it, and uh, we worked on it, and uh, became Highlander. Um, but um, it was uh, it was a very strong story. Um, and the thing about it is that, in some ways, when when the film was made, it was made as like. As a, as a complete film in a way that right, it had a right. beginning and, and an end and a finale you know, uh, and so uh, when he got the prize and became mortal and whatever there was no at that point um, there was no sort of consideration of doing a sequel <laughs> now, now I mean Highlander itself though it's it has such a cult following, and it's it's really after thirty years, it's it is quite loved. But when it came out here in the United States, you know, it, it really it just kind of missed the mark in in the theaters. But you know, when it hit home video, it, it really came to life. Is there anything you can specifically pinpoint that you think that here in the states we just weren't <laughs> ready for it well, when it came out? Yeah, I think I think I think the initial the initial release in America. Um, was and a, a few scenes were omitted, and probably one of the most crucial scenes. Um, that was when the young girl is saved in World War Two as a twelve-year-old girl, and um, who then becomes his secretary. Um, so you never, in the American version, at first you never quite realised why he had such a close relationship with this woman, mm -hmm. and. It wasn't until people saw the European version, which now you can see in America, um, and that, that that scene's been restored back into the film. Um, and I think even the French scene was originally cut out, where he's dueling in France. And that was cut out of the American version. So there are a number of scenes omitted, um, and I, just, I don't think the campaign was maybe um, top notch. Um, and it wasn't really until we came, went to to France. Uh, for the premiere in France, and all the Queen were there and whatever, and we went down the, the main avenue of Paris and down and there's these sixty foot statues of cardboard cutout statues of Christophe and Sean on each side of the boulevard and Jean Saint and it was like it was like this event. It was extraordinary, um, and the premiere was I've never seeing a, an audience rise and, and up and down in cheers and claps and it was, it was like a rock concert. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was quite something else. That's and uh, I, I, I think that's when it caught on and um, you know, the full version came out. But right. um, yeah, I, me I remember the I think it lasted about four days in America in its initial <laughs> run. <laughs> and it came up with this very strange black and white poster, um, which looked like a, it was about a serial killer. Um, and I, don't know, I think, I think it, was, it was a campaign that finally missed the mark, maybe. And you also shot a bunch of extra footage that was cut out, but and you put it in a, a warehouse and it was lost in a fire? Is that right? That's the rumor going around that there was a fight with a um, Kurgan versus a four hundred year old immortal and things like that. Uh, that that I don't know. I, mean, I, do, I don't know whether I shot that footage. I know <laughs> the extra footage. I mean, I mean, I know the the World War Two scene was a scene that was in the original script, 
Um, and um, we never we never filmed it um, on the day. And then we cut the film together, and and I looked at the film and with the producers and said, "Listen, this that scene from World War Two is crucial." And I know we cut it out, but for budget reasons or whatever. And so basically, I just got my bunch of video hooligans <laughs> <laughs> together on a weekend, and um, we got Christoph to come over, and we went to some um, um, desolate area in London, and um, rented a tank and whatever, and uh, a few friends, and we ran around and we shot the World War Two sequence. <laughs> um, and put it in the film, and it made all the difference, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, but that was that was filmed um, sort of quietly and um, sort of offhandedly, you know. Right. <laughs> now, is it true that you had a bit with Connery about finishing his uh, filming in seven days? Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what What did I you mean, bet? Look, what was I the mean, bet about? Well, well, you know, I mean. He he had he had he had a deal and and and, and got him and uh, uh, the, that he was going to be had seven days of shooting and on the last and he did quite a bit of the film and on his last day on the last hour um, and if he went over he'd get a certain amount more money <laughs> he says he sort of turned to me in the last like. 20 minutes and said, uh, you're not going to finish with me, are you? And I said, Sean, just stand there. And I put three cameras on him and it was sort of an obscure background. And I said, uh, put the hat on, turn left, turn right, look angry, now turn around, smile, now swing your sword, do the hat off, do the same thing, now do this and do that. And I'm screaming out different things to him and he's looking up and down and he's popping in and out and the camera's are painting with him and he's entering left and right and boom, boom, close up, he sees, da 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 da. And I'm looking at my watch and tick, tick, tick. And the minute he was coming in and I went, and you're wrapped. And he told me, he said, he told me, he said, you bastard. <laughs> In a very strong country, charming way, of course. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and then some of those shots, and some of many of those shots are in the film. Um, <laughs> <laughs> do we ever show Sean Connery turning left and uh, sort of smiling or whatever? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I'm gonna have to look for that now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Russell, I got to ask, what exactly happened with Highlander 2? What was your original tent versus what the studio actually put out? Oh, God, I don't know. There's about 14 variations of that film. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, I really don't want to talk about Highlander 2 too, 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 too much. That's the only um, Because it was... <sighs> what can I say? Um... It was a, sort of an, an era before we even started shooting, really. <laughs> oh, man. Um, uh, and um, it was, uh, you know, somewhat of a desperate attempt at um, trying, to, because once Highland became a hit, then they went, oh, shit. Um, and I think I think films these days now, and actually films like the 30s and 40s also had an out or, or an in. For sequel, even Frankenstein had a you know you made a sequel of Frankenstein, right? Um, um, but Highland was such a um, a complete finale. You know, he became mortal. Boom, boom. Yeah, you know, he won the prize. All the Im other immortals were dead. That's why he won the prize. And so the story was told. It was like close the book, mm -hmm. start making Moby Dick two. Um, <laughs> You know, it's like, I don't, I don't know. So, uh, some rather contrived storyline was, there were a few, and one was filmed, and and I remember even doing the shooting, I was saying, listen, we're, we're, we're breaking some of the rules here. Uh, mm -hmm. We're saying this, and now we're saying this, and <laughs> so this whole idea of this other planet and whatever, and I think none of that's been cut out. Um, 
in some of the versions, the re- renegade version, I think there's more Planet of Zeist. Um, but, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, for example, Star Trek um, got it right in the second one or, in, or whatever, when they actually, because they can do it, because they, I, I'm, I'm very much uh, a believer in the, in, with the genre type film, science fiction, horror, whatever genre, yeah. um, but you, you have your own rule book, you have your own Bible, no, no religious thing, but what I call a Bible, or your rule book, your manual. And I think if you, as long as you stick with those rules that you set up within your story, then you can do whatever you like. Um, but you can't break your own rules. And I think Highlander 2 sort of breaks some of the rules and piss some of the fans off, rightly so. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I know when I was shooting, I was thinking, oh, I can't go breaking that rule. Oh. <laughs> um, but I'm down here in Argentina and it's like, oh, God. Let's just go and finish this thing. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, um, it um, it probably wasn't the uh, the best thing, um, uh, and uh, but yeah, no, I'm proud. I'm proud of Highlander and. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. right, rightfully so. Yeah, rightfully right, so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, only got one more question for you, Russell, and then we'll let you go. We, uh, so uh, you know, you, you've done a ton of music videos. You've done movies. You, cool. most, most recently, you've done uh, TV shows. You did Teen Wolf, and now you're working on the Lizzie Borden yeah, Chronicles, yeah, was... right? Sorry, you're working on the Lizzie Borden Chronicles, right? With Christine uh, Ritchie. I am. I just um, we we filmed um, the Lizzie Borden. Uh, uh, we finished like in December or whenever last year. They're coming out very soon. Uh, it's a fantastic character. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, it was just, it was so terrific. I love doing that, that sort of period thing and having a female serial killer. And, um, it's, it's just really, really, it was really, that was a really, really great experience. Um, and uh, Christina Ricci, wonderful actress, um, and um, very enjoyable experience. And also, you know, a game with Team Wolf, where after season five now, and we didn't, we didn't really know. You know when we were doing the, the pilot, Jeff and I, Jeff Davis and I, when we were doing the pilot um, in Atlanta five years ago, we had no idea. We knew we were trying to do something different, something that was scary and suspenseful and sexy and fresh. Um, and um, but uh, it, it it caught on, and um, we always try to reimagine it and uh, keep it fresh. And uh, and it's been a great experience. So I think again, I think with Lily Borden too. I think. It's uh, it's really refreshing to see uh, a female take on um, a really juicy role like this, you know. Mm. And uh, and she really sort of um, she really grabs it by the nuts, so to speak, <laughs> and goes and runs with it. And she's 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 wonderful. That's and awesome. uh, and clear uh, clear Javel and uh, really 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 delicious cast. It's very cool. So that that's yeah. uh, that's coming out soon, and then you get a uh, season five of Teen Wolf uh, starts up in a season five, yeah, about a month or two ago. Out, um, yeah. Season five part A, and then we'll do part season five part B later this year, and uh, and then um, move on, yeah, and, and um, uh, looking forward to season six. <laughs> <laughs> very cool, Russell. It's so cool, Russell. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, guys, for your time and uh, uh, keep, in, keep enjoying the movies. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. All right, sir. Thank okay. you. Bye. I'll, talk to you. I'll talk to you later, guys. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.